Hey, and welcome to uh, Unit 8 for Pharmacology. Um, we have four chapters to go through. Um, first chapter is Chapter 20, and we are going to be discussing Central Nervous System Stimulants. And uh, the categories or subclasses for CNS stimulants are, include amphetamines, analeptics, caffeine, and anorexics. They, um, the only uh, medically approved uses for CNS stimulants are for treatment of uh, attention deficit disorder or hyperactivity disorder if a patient's been diagnosed with narcolepsy or for the reversal of respiratory distress. The uh, pathophysiology behind attention deficit slash hyperactivity disorders is that there is a dysregulation of the neurotransmitters of the brain, and those neurotransmitters are serotonin, norepinephrine, and or dopamine. Um, it typically occurs in children before the age of seven, and it is a little bit more common in males than females. Um, it's In some cases, it may not be identified until a early excuse me, early adulthood. Um, and um, these disorders can be misdiagnosed. Um, one class of medications um, that we need to discuss about is amphetamines. Um, they stimulate the release of norepinephrine and dopamine, the neurotransmitters. Um, amphetamines and related anorexins um, anorexants are those drugs that decrease appetite, so you don't feel hungry and you don't eat as much. These are greatly abused, and long-term use of amphetamines can produce psychological dependence or tolerance. Um, tolerance is a condition in which larger and larger doses of a drug are needed to produce the initial response. Um, amphetamines ordinarily will cause euphoria and alertness, but they also can cause uh, restlessness, tremors, irritability, or even sleeplessness. Amphetamines are primarily pre prescribed for narcolepsies and in some cases ADHD, and that's when um, we use that typically when the amphetamine-like drugs are ineffective. And Amphetamine-like drugs for ADHD, the big one that most people have heard of is Ritalin. Um, it is used to decrease impulsiveness, to decrease hyperactivity, and restlessness. Um, Ritalin can also be used to treat narcolepsy. There is the potential for abusing this drug, and that is why it is classified as a controlled substance scheduled drug. So we need to have the provider write a paper prescription so that the patient can present that directly to the pharmacy. And one important interaction that you need to know is that we need to avoid caffeine while a patient is taking Ritalin. Some additional nursing interventions to be mindful of is this dosing should be given before breakfast and lunch. Patients should be instructed to report any sort of irregular heartbeat. We want to uh, make sure that we are recording the growth of children. We want uh, children and adults alike to avoid caffeine, adults to avoid alcohol as well. And this is a medication that should not be stopped abruptly. We want to taper it to avoid withdrawal symptoms. Um, from there, we go to anorexants. Um, these were once freely prescribed, but because they have a high incidence of tolerance, psychological dependence, and abuse, they are no longer recommended for use as appetite suppressants. For weight loss attempts, emphasis should be placed on a nutritious diet, exercise, and behavioral modification. Reliance on appetite suppressants should be discouraged. Long-time use of any of these medications frequently result in such uh, side effects as nervousness, restlessness, irritability, insomnia, heart palpitations, and or hypertension.
Uh, that brings us to respiratory central nervous system stimulants, um, dox, doxapram or dopram is used to treat respiratory depression caused by either drug overdose, pre or post anesthetic respiratory depression, and or COPD. Um, side effects or doxapram are infrequent. However, with an overdose, you can see tachycardia, hypertension, um, hyperactive reflexes. That brings us to central nervous system depressions. This is a, a broad classification that includes sedative hypnotics, general anesthetics, analgesics, opioids and non-opioid analgesics, anticonvulsants, antipsychotics, and antidepressants. There are some terms that you want to be familiar with. Um, the terms that I'm going to define for you are dependence, tolerance, withdrawal, and hangover. Dependence can be either physical or psychological, and with withdrawal, there will be signs and symptoms. Tolerance is the need to increase the dose to achieve the same desired effect. Withdrawal is within 24 hours and can last for days. And symptoms include muscle twitching, tremors, dizziness, orthostatic hypotension, delusions, hallucinations, delirium, or even seizures. And a hangover is residual drowsiness. From here, we need to discuss the stages of sleep because when we depress the central nervous system, it will induce um, what looks like sleep. So what is sleep? There is rapid eye movement and non-rapid eye movement. Both of them typically occur cyclically during sleep at about 90 minute intervals. The period of M, excuse me, REM sleep episodes become longer during the sleep process. If sleep is interrupted, the cycle begins again with stage one of non-REM sleep. It is very difficult to rouse a person during REM sleep, and individuals perform better during their waking hours if they experience all types and stages of sleep. If a person is roused from REM sleep, frequently they will recall a vivid or bizarre dream. There are also sleep disorders that we need to be familiar with. Insomnia, um, it is more common in female pages and the risk increases with age. Um, both uh, sedatives, hypnotics can be used to treat this um, insomnia diagnosis, but we always want to try non-pharmacological management first. And the recommendations include no daytime naps, try to wake and go to bed at the same time each day. You can have warm fluids to drink before bed. You should avoid caffeine six hours prior to bedtime. You should also avoid having a heavy meal or exercising prior to bedtime. And we can also encourage them taking a warm bath, reading or listening to music to help them relax. That brings us to sedative hypnotics. Um, the mildest form of central nervous system depression is sedation. And that diminishes physical and mental responses, but does not affect consciousness. Sedatives are used mostly in the daytime. And increasing a sedative's dose can produce a hypnotic effect, not hypnosis, but a form of natural sleep. And we do want to avoid this class of drugs in patients that have respiratory disorders. So some key things to point out on this slide is that sedative hypnotics, if taken regularly for a period of time, require tapering of the drug to discontinue it 
and that is to avoid uh, and treat uh, dependence and tolerance. There are barbiturates, benzodiazepines, and non-benzodiazepines that fall in this classification. And there is over-the-counter medications, most commonly antihistamines, for example, Benadryl. And these can be good options, specifically if you have an arthritic patient that needs pain relief and a sleep aid. Something like Tylenol PM can work to um, serve as an analgesic and a sedative hypnotic because it contains both acetaminophen, an analgesic, and diphenhydramine, an antihistamine that causes drowsiness. Barbiturates have several subclasses. They are classified by how long they work. These were initially used for anti-anxiety effects in the, until the early 1960s, and then benzodiazepines were introduced. Because many of the side effects for barbiturates are not highly tolerable, and they have a high potential for physical and mental dependency, they are less frequently prescribed. Um, Long-acting group, just to touch base on, includes phenobarbital and is used to control seizures and epilepsy. Otherwise, for barbiturates, they are restricted to short-term use, that means two weeks or less, because of the side effects, including drug tolerance. That brings us to benzodiazepines. So after the 60s, we turned to benzodiazepines more frequently. Um, Xanax is probably one that you've heard of, as well as Ativan and Valium. Um, benzodiazepines interact with the neurotransmitter GABA to reduce neuron excitability. Uses are to reduce anxiety and to treat insomnia. Um, a patient who uses a benzodiazepine as a sleep aid for several months should taper their dose to avoid withdrawal symptoms when stopping. Uh, a subset of this is a non-benzodiazepine, specifically Ambien or Zolpidem. It is a neurotransmitter inhibitor. It has a long duration of six to eight hours with a short half-life. It is used specifically to treat insomnia and the patient should be instructed to take it within 30 minutes of bedtime. A caution, sedatives and hypnotics in older adults. We must identify the cause of insomnia in older adults um, and Non-pharmacological methods should be used before sleep medications are prescribed. Um, we want to use short to intermediate acting benzodiazepines. For example, um, Restoril is something that I've seen used frequently. We want to avoid benzodiazepines in these patients because um, they usually have a bigger effect on them. Some general nursing interventions for any patient taking a sedative hypnotic are listed here. Please be sure to review these notes. Let's move on now to anesthetics. Uh, there is general anesthetic and local anesthetic. Both of them require a preoperative assessment. And we want to ask about regular alcohol or drug use because they may need dose changes in their anesthesia. Um, nurses play an important role in patient assessment before and after general and local anesthesia is given. We prepare the patient for surgery by explaining the preparations, completing preoperative orders, including pre-medications, and we are necessary to enhance the safety and effectiveness of anesthesia and surgery. General anesthesia depresses the central nervous system, alleviates pain, and causes a loss of consciousness. 
local anesthesia is analgesia in a limited area. And the routes are listed on this slide. Specifically with local anesthetics, they block the pain at the site where the drug is administered. The patient remains conscious. Some specific uses are with dental procedures, uh, pr doing sutures, um, we could do nerve blocks, um, or prior to procedures, we can numb that area so that the patient has decreased pain. Uh, let's see, there's two groups, the esters and the amides. Amides have a low incidence of allergic reaction. Uh, procaine and lidocaine are very commonly used. Um, procaine is more for dental and lidocaine is more uh, topical. Spinal anesthesia is when a local anesthetic is injected into the subarachnoid space. The nursing intervention you need to remember is post-injection, your patient needs to remain completely flat for six to eight hours afterwards. We also need to monitor for side effects, adverse effects. The big one is respiratory distress, headache, or hypotension. And the reason why we need patients to remain completely flat for six to eight hours afterward is to decrease the likelihood of spinal fluid leaking out the puncture point. Next is anticonvulsants. Primarily used to treat a disorder called epilepsy. With epilepsy, it is an abnormal electrical discharges that are occurring from the cerebral neurons. Epilepsy is typically a lifelong disease that requires daily medications for life. It is um, it unfortunately um, occurs in young people. The majority of people with epilepsy will have their first seizure before the age of 20. There are characteristics that I'm going to talk about in future slides. The causes, it can be unknown or idiopathic. It can, a seizure can be caused and epilepsy can be caused secondary to trauma, uh, a, a brain injury or infection. And you can have what is an isolated seizure due to fever, electrolyte or acid base imbalances. The characteristics of a seizure. There are two big types. One is generalized, the other is partial. Generalized seizures are either tonic-clonic or absent. Tonic-clonic used to be called grand mal. It is the most common type of seizure. There is a generalized alternating muscle spasms and jerkiness versus absent seizures, which used to be called petite mal. With these, you have a brief loss of consciousness and the person just looks like they're staring off to nowhere. Then you have partial seizures, which are usually psychomotor in nature and either cause repetitive behavior, behavioral changes, or motor seizures. One other thing to note about these two main types of seizures is that a generalized seizure is going to cause loss of consciousness and it involves both hemispheres of the brain. Versus a partial seizure typically will not induce a loss of consciousness and involves one hemisphere of the brain. Anticonvulsants, anti-epileptic drugs. They work in one of four ways. They either suppress sodium influx, suppress calcium influx, enhance the action of GABA, or promote GABA release.
Drugs used for epileptic seizures are called either anticonvulsants or anti-epileptic drugs, AEDs. All anticonvulsant drugs stabilize nerve cell membranes and suppress the abnormal electrical impulses. These drugs prevent seizures but do not eliminate the cause or provide a, a cure. There are many types of anticonvulsants and examples are listed on this slide after each subtype. The first one I would like to talk about is phenytoin. Phenytoin works by inhibiting sodium influx. There are some severe side effects of phenytoin or dilantin. Um, they can include neurological, psychological problems, thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, or gingival hyperplasia. And patients on Dilantin for long periods of time might have an elevated blood glucose, so we're going to want to watch their uh, blood glucose levels. Um, a drug interaction is common with uh, Dilantin, um, and there's too many to list, um, but knowing that it's a drug that has a lot of interactions, when you go to give it, you want to be mindful, what am I giving with it? And all age-bearing female patients, so once you get your period to once you stop your period, age 12 to 45, 50, um, they must use backup birth control while taking oral contraceptives and Dilantin because it will affect its effectiveness. So some specific nursing interventions. We need to continue to monitor phenytoin levels. F high um, phenytoin levels are indicators of phenytoin toxicity. So therefore, we have to monitor the patient for signs and symptoms of toxicity or overdose. Initial symptoms are nystagmus or ataxia. Later symptoms can include things like hypotension, unresponsive pupils, and or coma. Uh, <clears throat> we need to protect them from environmental safeties. Um, we need to tell them to avoid alcohol, herbal supplements, other central nervous system depressants. Patients should not stop these medications abruptly. Uh, diabetics and long-term use patients must monitor their blood glucose level. We need to have the patient be educated on oral hygiene and frequent dental checkups. Uh, this medication may turn their urine a harmless pinkish red or brown. We need to encourage these patients to report any sore throat, bruising, or nosebleeds because they may indicate an adverse reaction or a blood dyscrasia. From there, we go to barbiturates. Phenobarbital treats uh, many different types of seizures. It does have a therapeutic range as well. Um, so we need to monitor that lab value for this drug as well. We also need to gradually taper this medication to avoid the recurrence of seizures. Benzodiazepine, some commonly prescribed ones are listed on this slide. Um, there are three benzodiazepines that have anticonvulsant effects. They're clonazepam, clorazepate, and diazepam. Uh, clonazepam is effective in controlling petite mal or absent seizures. Um, and diazepam is primarily used for treating acute status epileptus and must be administered IV to achieve the desired response. We have valproic acid, which is also um, good at tra treating a variety of types of seizures. Um, care should be taken when giving this drug to very young children 
or to patients that have liver disorders because hepatotoxicity is one of the possible adverse reactions. So we do want to monitor liver enzymes with this treatment. It also has a therapeutic range. Um, and as a side note, for all of these anticonvulsant drugs, we usually start our doses low and gradually increase over a period of weeks until the serum drug level is within the therapeutic range or the seizures stop. As a side note, anticonvulsants in pregnancies, um, seizure episodes increase in people, excuse me, women with epilepsy who are pregnant, and that can cause hypoxia during seizures that affect both the patient and the fetus. We need to be mindful that many anticonvulsant drugs have teratogenic effects that increase the risk for fetal malformations. And anticonvulsants tend to act as inhibitors of vitamin K, which contributes to the risk of bleeding in infants shortly after birth. Anticonvulsants also increase the excretion of folate in pregnant women, and we need to have proper folic acid levels to um, have proper fetal development, specifically the neural tubes. Anticonvulsants in febrile seizures. Usually um, a seizure due to fever occur in children that are very young, ages three months to five years. Um, and uh, prophylactic anticonvulsant treatment may be indicated for high risk patients, um, but do know that valproic acid should not be given to children younger than two years because of its possible hepatotoxicity. Um, an important concept is anticonvulsants in status epileptus. What that is, is a continuous seizure state, and it is considered a medical emergency. If treatment is not begun immediately, death could result. So this requires quick intervention of IV diazepam or lorazepam, possibly IV phenytoin, and if those are not uh, effective, we will try to treat continued seizures with either Versed or Propofol or even phenobarbital. Moving on to chapter 23, drugs for neurological disorders, specifically Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. Parkinson's disease is a chronic neurological disorder where there is an imbalance in the neurotransmitters dopamine and acetylcholine. Just to review, dopamine is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, acetylcholine is an excitatory neurotransmitter. So dopamine normally helps maintain control of acetylcholine and inhibits its excitatory response. So with Parkinson's, there is too little dopamine, too much acetylcholine. So that is why we have the characteristics that we have. Tremors of the head and neck, rigidity, bradykinesia, Postural changes, typically these patients walk with their head and chest thrown forward. Walking is impaired. They have a short shuffling walk. They have a lack of facial expression and they may do pill rolling motion of their hands. There are anti-Parkinson drugs. The first class I wanna talk about is anticholinergics. They um, inhibit the release of acetylcholine. And in Parkinson's, there's too much acetylcholine, not enough dopamine. Um, the co common one that you will see is cogentin. Um, they, uh, anticholinergic drugs that is, reduce rigidity and some of the tremors characteristic of Parkinson's. 
Um, they um, are contraindicated in people that do have glaucoma. And uh, let's see. Patients with COPD may have problems with thick mucus if they are on large doses of anticholinergics. There are some anticholinergic nursing interventions that you should be mindful of. We want to monitor vital signs, urine output, because as we know from the antihistamine chapter, anticholinergics can cause urinary retention. We want to encourage these patients to include increase their fluid intake, their fiber, and exercise to avoid constipation. Again, another anticholinergic side effect. Um, we want to advise these patients to avoid alcohol, caffeine, and aspirin. And uh, it will cause some photophobia, so we should do um, uh, encourage use of sunglasses. Another class of anti-Parkinson drugs is dopaminergics. Uh, as I said in the first slide, that with Parkinson's, there's too little dopamine. So these mimic dopamine, thus making the brain think that there's more available. And that opposes the acetylcholine. So the most common one that you need to be familiar with is Cinemet which is carbidopa levodopa. Carbidopa-levodopa are two meds combined into one pill. And um, the first drug was levodopa. That's the first one that we found. Um, but because of the side effects of levodopa, and the fact that so much levodopa is metabolized prior to reaching the brain, an alternative drug, carbidopa, was developed. And by inhibiting the enzyme in the peripheral nervous system, it allows levodopa to reach the brain. So basically what happens is carbidopa paired with levodopa um, it allows more of the medication to reach the brain because less of it is used up in the peripheral nervous system. It does have some side effects. Please know these. There are some drug interactions. Please be mindful of these. A little bit more about carbidopa levodopa. <clears throat> when levodopa is used alone, only 1% reaches the brain because 99% of it is used up in the peripheral nervous system. But when we combine carbidopa with levodopa, more levodopa reaches the brain. Very important concept for you to be familiar with. And that's why it's a combination drug. There are some specific nursing interventions you need to know. We need to monitor these patients for orthostatic hypotension. We want to have them take low protein foods because high protein foods interfere with drug transport to the central nervous system. Um, food definitely does slow down the drug absorption, um, but food can also help decrease GI upset. Um, we want the patient to uh, avoid uh, B6 rich foods and supplements and alcohol because vitamin B6 inhibits conversion of levodopa to dopamine. Um, we want to warn that it may cause some harmless brown discoloration of urine. We want to assess for any suicidal tendencies. Um, we want to uh, assess the blood count, liver, and kidney function. From Parkinson's, let's talk about Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is an incurable dementia illness. It is chronic, progressive, and neurodegenerative. 
It's theorized that Alzheimer's disease results from neuritic plaques, degeneration of the cholinergic neurons, and a deficiency in acetylcholine. It is marked with cognitive dysfunction. There are factors that um, are thought to uh, influence the occurrence of Alzheimer's, including genetic predisposition, viral infection, or inflammation processes. Symptoms of Alzheimer's include memory loss, confusion, inability to communicate, aggressive behavior, depression, or even psychosis. There is no cure for Alzheimer's. There are FDA approved medications to treat Alzheimer's disease. And we are going to discuss those. This slide just shows you the neuroatic plaque changes that occur um, in the brain cells. Alzheimer's disease, we've talked about that. What are the signs and symptoms? So that brings us to the specific medications that we use to manage the symptoms of Alzheimer's. The probably most common one is Aricep or Donzapril. Um, it basically allows more acetylcholine to the neuron receptors and that increases cognitive function. And that's the big thing to know um, about um, the anti-Alzheimer uh, medications. Moving on to our last chapter, chapter 24, drugs for neuromuscular disorders, myasthenia gravis, multiple sclerosis, and muscle spasms. Myasthenia gravis, or MG, is an autoimmune disorder, excuse me, disease resulting from a loss of acetylcholine. What happens is our body's own immune system antibodies uh, obstruct the binding of acetylcholine and actually eventually destroy receptor sites. And the results of this is ineffective muscle contraction and muscle weakness. With MG, there is a lack of nerve impulses and muscle responses, which causes fatigue and muscular weakness in the respiratory system, facial muscles, and extremities. It is a chronic autoimmune neuromuscular disease. It is not a genetic disorder, but there can be a familial tendency. Some early symptoms are ptosis and diplopia. Medications used to treat myasthenia gravis include um, neostigmine, Tensilon and pyridostigmine. Um, these are cholinesterase inhibitors. They inhibit the action of the enzyme, which results in more acetylcholine being available to help with muscle contraction. Overdose and underdosing is critically important to take into consideration with these medications. These medications should be given on time because too early or too late could result in um, either a myasthenia gravis crisis or a cholinergic crisis. So overdose or underdosing are very important concepts for you to be mindful of when giving a patient with MG their medications. These two uh, crises have similar uh, side effects or signs and symptoms. Um, and it, just be mindful that overdosing and underdosing is very important, which I pick up on the next slide, because they have similar symptoms. Those symptoms include severe muscle weakness, excessive salivation or drooling, pupil constriction, facial muscle fasciculations, and just for clarifying, a myasthenia crisis is when they're underdosed 
a cholinergic crisis is when they're overdosed. So too little or too much medication. Some nursing interventions for these medications. Every dose must be delivered on time. We should take these patients, excuse me, we should have these patients take their drugs 30 to 60 minutes before their meals, and we need to monitor for effectiveness. There are two drugs that we want to have on hand. One is listed on this slide, which is atropine. That is the antidote if a patient has a cholinergic crisis. The other is Tensilon. It will help us distinguish whether they are having a cholinergic or a myasthenia gravis crisis. Those are important to know. A little bit more about a myasthenia crisis. Um, that is inadequate dosing and there are additional triggers. They can involve the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles. So this is really bad because if untreated, it can cause death from paralysis of their respiratory muscles. They literally cannot breathe. So a myasthenic crisis is a severe generalized muscle weakness that can involve muscles of respiration, such as the diaphragm and intercostal muscles. Triggers include too little dosing, infection, severe emotional stress, your monthly menses, pregnancy, having a surgery or a trauma, temperature extremes, or alcohol intake, or electrolyte imbalances. A myasthenic crisis can occur three to four hours after taking certain medications. For example, certain antibiotics, calcium channel blockers, or phenytoin. Cholinergic crisis is overdose. They have had too much medication. This is an acute exacerbation with accompanying symptoms including meiosis, pallor, sweating, vertigo, excess salivation, nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramping, uh, bradycardia, or fasciculations. Um, if uh, a patient is having a crisis and we don't know because the symptoms are so similar, we will use Tensilon to distinguish whether it's a myasthenic crisis or a cholinergic crisis. If it's a myasthenic crisis, the patient will get better. If it's a cholinergic crisis, the patient will get worse. We move on now to multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disorder that attacks the myelin sheath of nerve fibers in the brain and spinal cord, which causes lesions that are called plaque. Onset of MS is usually slow. It is a condition in which there are remissions and exacerbations of multiple symptoms. It is an autoimmune disorder that is important to remember. There is no specific diagnosis test for this, but generally they can see the plaque on the nerve fibers um, or the lesions in an MRI. There are some laboratory tests that we can do, um, but again, no specific diagnostic test. With an acute attack of MS, um, you will expect the doctor to prescribe uh, glucocorticoids like prednisone or adrenocorticotropin hormone, otherwise known as ACTH. In a remission exacerbation stage, you can expect the physician to prescribe a biologic response modifier. And lastly, if your patient is in a chronic progressive state, you expect immunosuppressant therapy to be prescribed, 
like cyclophosphamide, otherwise known as, say, toxan. All three of these treatment strategies are to decrease the inflammatory process and improve conduction just by different techniques. You can read more about this in your textbook, including the signs and symptoms that we are trying to treat. From there, we move on to skeletal muscle relaxants. Muscle relaxants relieve muscular spasms and pain associated with traumatic injuries or spasticity from chronic debilitating disorders like multiple sclerosis. Um, these are centrally acting muscle relaxants that depress neuron activity um, and inhibit uh, the action of the skeletal muscles. The exact mechanism isn't fully known, um, but they work specifically to uh, treat that um, hyperexcitable neurons that are triggering this the spine or excuse me the muscle movement so a few that you should know is baclofen and tiazidine they um, are very commonly prescribed um, another one is cyclobenzaprine um, and the unique thing about cyclobenzaprine is that it doesn't cause the drug dependence that you can see with baclofen, tiazidine, or uh, scalaxin. That's another commonly prescribed one as well. Uh, to talk a little bit more about cyclobenzaprine, or flexoril is it, as it's commonly known. Its action is to relax skeletal muscles. It has some side effects, including anticholinergic effects. It can cause drowsiness, dizziness, headache. Those are the common side effects. The nursing interventions you need to know with a skeletal muscle relaxant is these patients should take it with food. We need to monitor liver function assess vital signs. A patient should be advised not to drive while taking this medication. And typically these are not prescribed for longer than three weeks and they shouldn't be abruptly stopped. We want to taper it and discontinue it over approximately one week to avoid rebound spasms. And the patient should also receive education to avoid alcohol and other central nervous system depressants. As typical, this last slide shows you some medications that you should be familiar with from this unit. Thank you very much for listening.